brain, the brain develops from five primordia. Later, as certain divisions become greatly enlarged, they overgrow other regions of the developing brain so that the adult brain, on a cursory inspection, presents only three divisions, the cerebral hemispheres, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. The largest portion of the adult brain is the cerebral hemispheres, which are generally responsible for analyzing sensory input, memory, learning, motor function, etc. The cerebellum is generally responsible for coordination, balance, and influences on muscle. The brainstem, the third part, is responsible for many basic vital life functions such as heartbeat, breathing, blood pressure, etc. Additionally, all of the cranial nerves emanate from the brainstem. Cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, bathes the entire central nervous system, CNS. The CNS develops from a hollow tube that later expands to form ventricles within the brain and the central canal of the spinal cord. This lumen is filled with CSF, which is produced by the choroid plexus in the ventricles. The CSF enters the subarachnoid space via certain foramina, where it circulates and is eventually resorbed into the superior sagittal sinus by elements from both the pia and the arachnoid called the arachnoid granulations. The CSF may act as a hydrodynamic protective cushion to absorb sudden traumas, in addition to providing nutrient functions. Meninges are the three layers of membrane that cover the central nervous system, CNS. The fibrous outer layer is called the dura mater. It is firmly attached to the interior of the bony cranium, whereas it is unattached to the vertebral column as it houses the spinal cord. The arachnoid, middle layer, is separated from the dura only by a simple layer of epithelium. Web-like processes extend from it into cerebrospinal fluid-filled subarachnoid space housing blood vessels between the arachnoid and the innermost of the meninges, the pia mater. Thr pia is closed adhered to the surface of the brain. The spinal cord, is a continuation of the medulla, extending from the first cervical vertebra to the first or second lumbar vertebra where the spinal cord ends as the conus medullaris. However, lumbar and sacral spinal nerves continue as the cauda equini to exit their respective intervertebral foramina. The subarachnoid space in the spinal cord houses CSF. In cross-section, the periphery of the spinal cord is white matter, whereas the central gray matter is arranged in the shape of an H. The horizontal crossbar represents the dorsal and ventral gray commissures. The legs of the H represent dorsal horns and ventral horns. The ventral horns house motor neurons whereas the dorsal horns receive sensory fibers. At thoracic levels, TIL2, the intermediolateral cell column, gray matter, houses all presynaptic sympathetic cell bodies. He brain and spinal cord together comprise the receiving, integrating, analyzing, and responding portion of the body, called the central nervous system, CNS. These are delicate, almost gelatinous structures that consist of cells with little intercellular connective tissue material. Because the CNS is so fragile and so important for the life and proper functioning of the individual, the brain and spinal cord are housed in bony compartments that protect them from injury. To provide further protection, the brain and spinal cord are surrounded by meningeal membranes and are bathed in cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. This chapter does not provide a thorough account of the CNS, that wants to be found in textbooks of neuroanatomy. Instead, a general account is included here to provide students with some terminology and a descriptive introduction to the morphology of the meninges, brain, and spinal cord. Meninges of the brain Three layers of meninges cover, support, and protect the brain, the innermost layer is the pia mater, the intermediate layer is the arachnoid, and the external fibrous layer is the dura mater. The brain and spinal cord are invested by three layers of membranes that, in addition to providing support and protection, act as a covering for blood vessels that supply the CNS. These three layers include the external almost dura mater, the middle arachnoid, and the innermost pia mater. The dura mater, the outer, coarse, fibrous covering of the brain, also covers the spinal cord, and the two are continuous with each other through the foramen magnum. That of the spinal cord is similar in concept, 
but it forms no reflections as does the cranial dura. Instead, the spinal dura is a cylindrical sheet that surrounds the spinal cord as well as the spinal nerve roots that pass through the intervertebral foramina. The external aspect of the spinal dura is not attached to bone, instead, a fatty connective tissue layer, the epidural fat, separates it from the periosteum and provides further cushioning of the spinal canal. The epidural fat contains the internal vertebral venous plexus, which empties into the venous sinuses of the cranial dura. The internal aspect of the cranial and spinal dura mater is lined by a simple, squamous type of epithelium, which separates the dura from the arachnoid. A potential space, the subdural space, is interposed between the epithelial linings of the dura and the arachnoid. The arachnoid, a thin, ovuscular layer, is covered by a simple, squamous epithelium and extends thin, web-like processes into the subarachnoid space, a CSF-filled region between the arachnoid and pia mater. The arachnoid and dura, although separated from each other by the potential subdural space, follow each other's contours. These membranes display connections at the spinal and cranial nerves, at the infundibulum of the hypophysis, in regions where vessels penetrate the dura to and from the subarachnoid space, as well as at the points where the denticulate ligaments of the pia attach and fix the pia to the dura. The subarachnoid space contains blood vessels and CSF. This fluid exits the subarachnoid space via the specialized arachnoid granulations, which, piercing the meningeal dura in the parietal region, deliver the CSF into the lacunae lateralis, located in the fovea granularis of the parietal bone. These lacunae are drained by vessels that empty into the superior sagittal sinus. The subarachnoid space becomes dilated in certain regions, forming cisterns, which are detailed later in this chapter. The pia mater is a delicate, cellular membrane that closely follows the contours of the brain and spinal cord, as well as the nerves emanating from them. Blood vessels passing through the subarachnoid space branch extensively on the superficial surface of the pia, which they pierce to enter the substance of the brain. Here, glial cells, supporting cells of the CNS, form a protective coating around the vessels, assisting in the establishment of an effective blood-brain barrier, controlling the entry of materials into the extracellular spaces of the brain and spinal cord. The CNS is a hollow structure lined by a special type of epithelium known as ependema. This epithelium, which is modified in certain areas of the brain, surrounds vascular intrusions of all elements to form the choroid plexus, which functions L and the elaboration of CSF. The brain is protected by its meninges as well as by its bony housing, the skull. The brain is an immensely complex structure whose organizational hierarchy is not completely understood. This section of the chapter does not attempt to discuss the functional aspects of neuroanatomy, instead, only the gross morphology of the brain is described. Divisions of the brain, during early embryogenesis, the brain is noted to be composed of five divisions. Some of these divisions greatly enlarge to overgrow other divisions, causing the brain to fold upon itself such that only three regions are immediately visible in the adult brain the cerebral hemispheres, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. The brain, during embryogenesis, is noted to be clearly divided into five continuous parts the telencephalon, diencephalon, mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon, arranged in an anteroposterior, rostrocaudal, direction. Regions of the developing brain become greatly enlarged and some of these portions overgrow others such that the brain begins to fold on itself, so much so that parts of the brain become submerged and surrounded by more rapidly growing elements. Hence, only three regions are evident on cursory examination of the whole adult brain, the cerebral hemispheres, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. Cerebral hemispheres, the largest portion of the brain is composed of the two cerebral hemispheres. The two hemispheres, derived from the telencephalon, are partly separated from each other by the deep longitudinal fissure, a space occupied by the falx cerebri. The surface of the brain is intimately invested by the almost invisible pia mater, which follows the convoluted elevations and depressions of the surface. Each elevation, or gyrus, is bounded by the depressions, or sulci. 
the locations of these sulci and gyri are relatively constant. The cerebral hemispheres completely fill the supratentorial space of the skull and may be subdivided into regions reflecting their anatomic position. Hence, there are frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, and insular lobes. The surface of each cerebral hemisphere is the cortex, consisting of gray matter. Deep to the cortex is white matter, consisting of fiber tracts passing to and from the cortex and other parts of the brain. Deep within this fibrous region of the cerebrum reside subcortical nuclei, groups of cell bodies that constitute the basal ganglia associated with somatic motor functions. The lateral convex surface of the cerebral hemisphere resembles a boxing glove, of which the thumb, pointing inferiorly, is the temporal lobe. A deep fissure, the lateral sulcus, separates the temporal from the frontal and parietal lobes. Deep to the temporal lobe, forming the floor of the lateral fissure, is the insula, a cortical lobe also covered by the frontal and parietal lobes. The occipital lobe, a relatively small, triangular portion of the cerebrum, lies caudal to the parietal lobe, forming the posterior terminus of the cerebrum. The central sulcus, running obliquely from just behind the center of the hemisphere to, but not into, the lateral fissure, separates the frontal and parietal lobes. The gyri, anterior and posterior to the central sulcus, are known as the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus, respectively. The former is a motor area, whereas the latter is a sensory area of the cortex. The sulcus caudal to the postcentral gyrus is the postcentral sulcus and the one anterior to the precentral gyms is the paracentral sulcus. The largest, or frontal lobe, of the cerebral hemisphere is bounded anteriorly by the anterior pole, posteriorly by the central sulcus, and inferiorly by the lateral sulcus. The precentral sulcus and precentral gyrus complete the frontal lobe. The region of the frontal lobe that covers the insula is known as the frontal operculum. The operculum and part of the inferior frontal gyrus function in speech. The parietal lobe is incompletely defined morphologically. Its anterior boundary is the central sulcus, whereas posteriorly the lobe is separated from the occipital lobe by an imaginary line extending from the parieto-occipital sulcus to the preoccipital notch. The region of the parietal lobe covering the insula is the parietal operculum. The temporal lobe has well-defined superior and inferior boundaries the lateral sulcus and the inferior extent of the CONV exity of the cerebrum and its posterior boundary is the imaginary line between the parieto-occipital sulcus and the preoccipital notch. Several short gyri may be observed on the inner aspect of the temporal lobe forming the inferior border of the lateral sulcus. These transverse gyri represent the primary auditory cortex. The occipital lobe is the posterior most aspect of the cerebral hemisphere and is separated from the parietal and temporal lobes by the imaginary line connecting the parieto-occipital sulcus and the preoccipital notch. The occipital lobe functions as the visual cortex. The insula is the region of the cerebral hemispheres that is hidden from view by the parietal, the frontal, and especially the temporal opercula. It forms the floor of the lateral sulcus and is reported to function in taste. The two cerebral hemispheres are structurally and functionally connected to each other by commissures, the larger of which is the corpus callosum, a midline structure forming the floor of the longitudinal fissure. The other commissure is the much smaller anterior commissure. The fornix also contains some commissural fibers, although these are not well developed in the human brain. The corpus callosum is best appreciated in the midsagittal view, where it is noted as a white, dense, salient feature of the brain. Fortuitous hemisection of the brain displays the septum pellucidum, stretched between the inferior aspect of the corpus callosum and the fornix, which intervenes between the two lateral ventricles of the cerebral hemisphere. The two lateral ventricles communicate with each other and with the third ventricle via the interventricular foramina, of Monral which are located just inferior to the anterior portion of the fornix. The medial aspect of the hemisect brain displays the cingulate gyrus, located superior to the corpus callosum. The well-defined parieto-occipital sulcus, delineating the anterior border of the occipital lobe, is also evident. <laughs>
the occipital lobe is subdivided into a superior cuneus and an inferior lingula by the calcarine fissure. When the cerebral hemisphere is viewed from the inferior perspective, the occipital and part of the temporal lobes are hidden by the cerebellum and the brain stem. The antero-inferior aspect presents the midline longitudinal cerebral fissure, lateral to which is the thin gyrus rectus and the olfactory sulcus with the attendant olfactory bulb and tract. Olfactory nerve synapse in the inferior aspect of the bulb after passing through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. The cerebellum, the cerebellum is a large structure displaying thin, leaf-like plates, the cerebellar folia, giving the cerebellum its distinctive appearance. The cerebellum lies deep to the tentorium cerebelli and is composed of two cerebellar hemispheres and the intervening vermis. This portion of the brain is derived from the metencephalon. The cerebellum consists of a thin gray matter mantle known as the cerebellar cortex, overlying the centrally located white matter containing several nuclei. Functionally, the cerebellum may be divided into three areas. The neocerebellum is responsible for precise coordination of muscle action, especially that related to movements of the hand. The paleocerebellum functions in maintaining proper posture in response to gravity. The archicerebellum is responsible for proprioception, especially that involved with spatial orientation. Brainstem The brainstem, the oldest part of the CNS, is obscured by the large cerebral and cerebellar hemispheres to such an extent that only its ventral and lateral aspects are visible in the whole brain. Removal of the cerebrum and cerebellum exposes the entire brainstem, which extends from the diencephalon rost rally to the myelencephalon, medulla oblongata, caudally. All cranial nerves arise from the ventral aspect of the brainstem, except for the trochlear nerve, which originates from its dorsal surface. Diencephalon, the diencephalon is the rostral most portion of the brainstem. It is composed of four regions, the epithalamus, thalamus, hypothalamus, and subthalamus. The diencephalon surrounds an ependymal line space, the third ventricle, which communicates with the lateral ventricles of the cerebrum via the interventricular foramen and with the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. The epithalamus is the dorsal surface of the diencephalon and is composed of the pineal body, an endocrine gland, the stria medullaris, and the habenula trigone, whose nuclei and interhabenula connections are associated with the olfactory system. The thalamus is the largest portion of the diencephalon and is separated into right and left halves by the third ventricle. The two thalami are interconnected by a bridge of gray matter, the massa intermedia, or interthalamic adhesion. All sensory stimuli, with the exception of olfaction, enter the thalamus and are redistributed to the sensory cortex for finer perception via the thalamocortical radiations. The thalamus contains many nuclei, some of which create prominent bulges on the surface of the diencephalon. The pulvinar is one such large caudal region of the thalamus, located just above the midbrain. Two other nuclei, the medial and lateral geniculate bodies, associated with hearing and sight, respectively, are located in the vicinity of the pulvinar. The hypothalamus is separated from the thalamus by a groove, the hypothalamic sulcus, located on either wall of the third ventricle. This small region of the diencephalon is associated with endocrine function, sleep, emotion, and regulation of temperature. Structures of the hypothalamus evident on the ventral surface of the brainstem are the hypophysis, pituitary gland, the small, elevated tuber cinereum with the attendant infundibulum of the hypophysis, and the two mammillary bodies, located caudal to the tuber cinereum. The subthalamus contains one major nucleus, the subthalamic nucleus, and a few small bundles of fiber tracts. This subdivision of the diencephalon is associated with somatic efferent functions. Mesencephalon, the mesencephalon, midbrain, is a short segment surrounding the cerebral aqueduct situated between the diencephalon and the pons. The dorsal aspect, or tectum, contains four marked elevations, the corpora quadrigemina, consisting of the two rost rally place superior colliculi, functionally related to the visual system, and the two caudally placed inferior colliculi, associated with hearing. 
the lateral geniculate body is connected to the superior colliculus via fiber bundles, the brachium of the superior colliculus, whereas the brachium of the inferior colliculus connects the inferior colliculus to the medlal geniculate body. Just inferior to this colliculus, the slender trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 4, emerges from the mesencephalon. This is the only cranial nerve to leave the dorsal aspect of the brain stem. The two cerebral peduncles, fiber tracts connecting the cerebrum to the brain stem, are located ventrally, below the cerebral aqueduct in a region known as the tegmentum. The interpeduncular fossa, between the two peduncles, displays the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3, leaving the brain stem metencephalon, the metencephalon is hidden from view by the cerebellum, but its ventral surface is clearly visible as the bulging pons the metencephalon is separated from the MCS insphalon by the superior pontine sulcus and from the myelencephalon by the inferior pontine sulcus. The dorsal aspect of the pons, which forms the floor of the fourth ventricle, is known as the tegmentum. The tegmentum contains the nuclei of cranial nerves V, 6, 7, and 8. As the facial nerve passes over the nucleus of cranial nerve 6, it forms a bulge on the floor of the fourth ventricle, the facial colliculus. The superior and middle cerebellar peduncles connect the cerebellum to the brainstem and cranial nerve V pierces the restal part of the middle cerebellar peduncle. The other three cranial nerves associated with the metencephalon leave the structure at the inferior pontine sulcus. Myelencephalon, the myelencephalon, medulla oblongata, is the caudal most portion of the brain stem. It extends from the inferior pontine sulcus to the spinal cord, demarcated approximately by the foramen magnum. The V-shaped lateral walls of the myelencephalon close over the fourth ventricle at the apex, the obex. Bilateral, cylindrical structures, the pyramids are evident on the ventral surface of the medulla. Pyramidal decussations, or crossings of fibers, appear across the anterior midline fissure from one pyramid to the other. Lateral to each pyramid is an olive pit-shaped bulge, the olive. Filaments of cranial nerve 12 are lodged in the groove, anterior lateral sulcus, between the pyramid and the olive, whereas cranial nerves 9, X, and 11 are located in the groove dorsal to the olive. Fiber connections between the medulla and the cerebellum are via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Located in the midline of the dorsal surface of the medulla is the posterior median fissure, lateral to which is the tuberculum gracilis, a swelling demarcating the underlying nucleus gracilis, on which many lower sensory neurons synapse. Lateral to the tuberculum gracilis is a similar swelling, the tuberculum cuneatus with the underlying nucleus cuneatus, where many sensory neurons from the upper part of the body synapse. The most lateral swelling is the tuberculum cinereum, representing the descending tract of the trigeminal nerve. Cerebrospinal fluid and ventricles. Cerebrospinal fluid. The CNS develops from a hollow cylindrical tube and retains the space in the adult as the ventricles of the brain and the central canal of the spinal cord. The ventricles and the central canal form a continuous channel filled with CSF, a clear, colorless, acellular liquid produced by specialized structures, the choroid plexus, located mostly in the ventricles. CSF is elaborated continuously, bathing the CNS. Some of the fluid enters the subarachnoid space via specialized foramina of the myelencephalon, the paired lateral foramina of Lushka and the single, medial foramen of Magendi. The CSF circulates in the subarachnoid space, eventually to be transported into the superior sagittal sinus by arachnoid granulations, Structures composed of elements from both the pia and the arachnoid The subarachnoid space closely follow the contours tours of the brain, except in certain regions where the arachnoid diverges, forming larger spaces known as cisterns. The three foramina of the myelencephalon empty into the cisterna magna, cisterna cerebellum gelarisal, the largest of the cisterns, located between the cerebellum and the medulla oblongata. Two other large cisterns in the head are worthy of mention, the cisterna superior, between the cerebellum and the midbrain, and the cisterna interpeduncularis, located between the two cerebral peduncles. Hence, the CNS is completely surrounded by CSF,
which may act as a hydrodynamic protective cushion, absorbing sudden traumas in addition to providing possible nutrient functions. Ventricles, the four ventricles of the brain are ependymal lined spaces containing CSF. The four ventricles of the brain containing CSF are the paired lateral ventricles of the cerebral hemispheres and the third and fourth ventricles. The paired lateral ventricles, the largest of the four, hollow out the cerebral hemispheres. These two ventricles myelencephalon, disease of or trauma to the myelencephalon is often fatal because this region of the brain is responsible for the vital functions of the body such as respiration and control of circulation. Are separated from each other by the intervening septum pellucidum, although a connection, the interventricular foramen, permits communication between the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. Each lateral ventricle has a body and anterior, posterior, and inferior horns. The third ventricle is surrounded by the right and left halves of the thalamus and is interrupted by a mass of gray matter, the massa intermedia, which crosses this ventricle. The third ventricle communicates with the fourth ventricle by the cerebral aqueduct. The fourth ventricle is located in the hindbrain and also communicates with the central canal of the medulla. NSF, as indicated previously, leaves the fourth ventricle to enter the subarachnoid space by way of the paired lateral foramina of Lushka and the median foramen of Magendi. Blood supply of the brain, arterial supply. Branches of the two vertebral arteries and the two internal carotid arteries provide the arterial supply to the brain. Arterial supply to the brain is derived from the two vertebral and two internal carotid arteries. The vertebral arteries enter the cranial cavity through the foramen magnum and, just before reaching the pons, fuse to form the single basilar artery. The two internal carotid arteries gain access to the cranial cavity via the carotid canals, pass through the cavernous sinus, and give branches to the brain. The vertebral artery, a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery, supplies three named branches to the CNS, the single anterior spinal artery and the posterior spinal artery, serving the medulla and the spinal cord, and the postero-inferior cerebellar artery, vascularizing the inferior aspect of the caudal portion of the cerebellum. The vertebral arteries of the two sides join to form the single basilar artery, which travels along the ventral aspect of the pons in the basilar groove. Branches of the basilar artery are the antero-inferior cerebellar, labyrinthine, pontine, superior cerebellar, and posterior cerebral arteries. The antero-inferior cerebellar artery, the caudal most branch of the basilar artery, supplies the inferior aspect of the anterior portion of the cerebellum. The small labyrinthine artery serves the cochlea and vestibular apparatus. Several small pontine arteries vascularize the pons, whereas the superior cerebellar artery passes between the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum to serve the superior aspect of the latter structure. The basilar artery bifurcates to give rise to the two posterior cerebral arteries, which serve the inferomedial aspect of the temporal and occipital lobes of the cerebrum. The posterior cerebral artery possesses an arterial connection to the internal carotid artery, the posterior communicating artery, thus forming the posterior arch of the cerebral arterial circle of Willis. Branches of the internal carotid artery are the anterior choroidal, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and ophthalmic arteries. The anterior choroidal artery supplies the choroid plexus and portions of the cerebral hemispheres. The middle cerebral artery courses laterally to pass between the temporal and parietal lobes. It supplies the lateral surfaces of most of the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes. The anterior cerebral artery passes anteriorly, on the inferomedial aspect of the gyrus rectus, to vascularize the medial and superior aspects of the frontal and parietal lobes. The two anterior cerebral arteries are interconnected by the short anterior communicating artery, thus completing the cerebral arterial circle. This arterial circle, circumscribing the mammillary bodies, the hypophysis, and the optic tracts, is composed arterial occlusion or rupture. The deeper regions of the brain, unlike most areas of the body, do not possess arterial anastomosis. Therefore, when an artery, example one of the named branches of the circle of Willis, is occluded or ruptures, 
the area of the brain that is affected is often widespread and, because nerve tissue does not repair itself, the damage produced is permanent. Stroke Stroke results from ischemic blood flow usually caused by occlusion of a cerebral artery in the brain, causing the patient to develop sudden neurological deficits. Although the first attack is not usually fatal, the patient is left neurologically impaired. Vessels of the circle of Willis provide collateral circulation to the damaged area, thus permitting some degree of rehabilitation for the patient. Of the two posterior cerebral, two posterior communicating, two internal carotid, two anterior cerebral, and the single anterior communicating arteries. The ophthalmic artery is not associated with vascularization of the brain. It passes through the optic foramen to enter and supply the orbit and its contents. Venous drainage, venous drainage of the brain arises from the pial venous plexus derived from the confluence of minute venous vessels. The cerebral veins are divisible into external and internal groups. The external veins drain into the regional venous sinuses. Venous drainage of the deeper regions of the brain eventually empty into the straight sinus via the great cerebral vein. Cerebellar veins also are of two groups, superior and inferior cerebellar veins. These drain into the straight sinus or other regional sinuses.